Today, there is a significant movement to re-establish the Hawaiian Islands as an independent nation, and for good reason. The story of Hawaii's statehood basically starts with the US military, the Dole Fruit Company, and some rich Americans illegally overthrowing the Hawaiian monarchy. Now, we won't start at the beginning of time. Hawaii's full history deserves its own video. But suffice to say, in the early 1800s, British explorers were starting to make frequent trips to the independent nation of Hawaii. Seafaring Brits would go sail the Pacific and basically make pit stops in Hawaii. Eventually, these visitors included American Christian missionaries. The Thaddeus was the first ship carrying missionaries from America to Hawaii. These missionaries were part-timers, that is, they all had vocational skills outside of spreading their gospel. They were physicians, teachers, printers, and farmers. So a lot of them used those skills and stayed in Hawaii. Regardless of my, ours, or your feelings about missionaries in general, they were decently received by the Hawaiians. That is, they lived amicably enough among the native people. Some of the Americans who came to Hawaii just wanted to make people Christian. But others wanted to make money. Sugarcane had been grown on a small scale in Hawaii for hundreds of years. Americans noticed this and realized that the land was ideal for sugarcane. Meanwhile, in America, it was a huge cash crop. So these Americans started growing sugarcane in Hawaii, and a lot of it. Americans began using up huge swaths of land in Hawaii for their sugarcane and fruit plantations. You could say this was when American colonization of Hawaii really started, even though any formal changes in government would come much later. And it's hard to overstate just how huge sugarcane farming got in Hawaii during the 1800s. When the Americans arrived, private land ownership did not exist in Hawaii. But in 1848, the king of Hawaii enacted the Great Mahele, a piece of legislation that redistributed the lands of Hawaii. The Great Mahele is regarded as one of the two most significant events in Hawaiian history. And we'll talk about the other one later. But if you want to learn more about the Great Mahele, and there's a lot to learn, you can watch a lecture at the URL in the video description below. The results of the Mahele were widespread and complex. Even today, its impacts are still being debated by scholars. But a definite, significant result was this. The Hawaiian government sold a whole lot of land to American sugar and pineapple plantations. If you wanted to be very generous, you could make the argument that these businessmen were not Americans, they were Hawaiians. Despite being ancestors of Americans, they were actually born in Hawaii. But as later events will reveal, their allegiance was decidedly to America, not Hawaii, and certainly not Hawaii's native people. After the Great Mahele, sugar and fruit companies basically had a stranglehold on Hawaii. The industry was tightly controlled by descendants of Americans, concentrated in a few corporations known in Hawaii as the Big Five. These five companies together gained control over huge parts of the Hawaiian economy, including banking, warehousing, shipping, and importing. Eventually, every good that came and went from Hawaii passed through the hands of the Big Five. Most of the island's residents were also, in some way, employed by the Big Five. So these few companies were essentially running Hawaii by this point. But essentially running Hawaii wasn't good enough. They wanted to officially run the country. So rich plantation owners formed the innocently titled Citizens Committee of Public Safety. This was basically a political action committee working to advance their own interests in Hawaiian society. But unofficially, it had much more radical plans. The committee formed a secret society called the Hawaiian League. There were no public records kept of the Hawaiian League, and members were strongly discouraged from discussing the group in public. The Hawaiian League wanted to overthrow the Hawaiian government and annex the nation to America. To help this happen, the Hawaiian League came into control of the Honolulu Rifles, a local militia based in Hawaii. At the time, the ruler of Hawaii was King Kalakaua. The Hawaiian League used the Honolulu Rifles to force the king to sign a new constitution. 
This document is sometimes called the Bayonet Constitution because it was quite literally signed at gunpoint at the end of bayonets. The document granted suffrage to foreigners, generally Americans, by linking the right to vote with property ownership. Americans owned most of the property, so by voting together, they could basically make whatever laws they wanted in Hawaii. But then King Kalakaua got sick and died. This left his sister, Queen Liliokulani, as sole ruler of Hawaii. Her goal was to restore power to the Hawaiians by eliminating the bayonet constitution and creating a new one. This idea was widely supported by the Hawaiian population. Of course, it would have taken the newfound power from the American businessmen, who, by the way, were not even citizens of Hawaii. But when the Hawaiian League heard of this, it was pretty much go time. They had the numbers and guns for a proper military overthrow of the monarchy. So one day, that's exactly what they did. The League held a mass public meeting on January 16th to denounce the Queen and garner support for a coup. And this was no small group. Over a thousand people attended, most of them white American males. John L. Stevens was stationed in Hawaii at the time as the American minister to the Kingdom of Hawaii. The Hawaiian League told Stevens that there would be a coup the next day and American descendants in Hawaii wouldn't be safe. So Stevens summoned U.S. troops from the nearby USS Boston to land on Hawaii. The next day, 162 armed sailors and marines came ashore. They were under orders of neutrality, never fired a shot, and did not enter the Hawaiian palace. However, this type of intimidation prevented the Hawaiian royalists from defending themselves. If the Hawaiians did anything, they'd just get killed by well-armed American soldiers. The queen, of course, realized this. So as the queen's ministers were in their police station, the Hawaiian League took over the government building without any resistance. From there, the League similarly took over other important buildings and the queen surrendered. The Hawaiian League had officially, successfully, and with the help of the US military, overthrown the government of Hawaii. But remember, this was only part of their ambition. They still wanted to get America to annex the nation. Sanford B. Dole was a lawyer living in Hawaii at the time. He was radically pro-West. He wanted Hawaii to become as American as possible, so the Hawaiian League instated him as the first Hawaiian president. Dole really wanted to make Hawaii a state. He thought that by becoming part of the Union, American-owned sugar and pineapple plantations in Hawaii would compete with those in the continental U.S. Dole tried to make this happen, but there was one huge problem. Grover Cleveland was U.S. president at the time, and he was very anti-imperialist. He was furious about the U.S.-sponsored coup. After ordering a full investigation into the incident, Cleveland discovered that U.S. troops had acted without orders from Washington to overthrow a sovereign government. Cleveland made an official recommendation to Congress that the Queen be reinstated, but Congress denied this measure and Hawaii was left in limbo. Sanford Dole bided his time until America elected William McKinley as its next president. After McKinley's election, his Republican Party called for the annexation of Hawaii. The Hawaiian people petitioned for a popular vote to decide the matter, but those calls were entirely ignored. William McKinley argued that if the U.S. did not annex Hawaii, then Japan would take over the islands. Hawaii officially became a U.S. territory in the year 1900. While not full statehood, it achieved what Dole wanted, more advantageous positioning in the U.S. marketplace. So his family's next move was no surprise. They founded the Hawaiian Pineapple Company, which later became the Dole Fruit Company. So, it was technically Sanford Dole's cousin, James Dole, who founded the fruit company. But let's not be naive. Sanford spent nearly a decade positioning Hawaii to be more advantageous to fruit and sugar companies. It would be quite a coincidence that the year after he succeeded in doing so, his cousin just happened to go into the fruit business. James Dole's entire strategy revolved around the commodification of Hawaiian culture. 
He believed that by exploiting the culture, he could brand pineapples as exotic luxury items and appeal to American consumers. And that's what he did. For decades, Dole Fruit Company exploited Hawaiian culture and people to sell pineapples. They branded Hawaii as a paradise free of work and full of leisure-loving locals. Dole pineapples were sold as truly Hawaiian. Their products featured images of Hawaiian people, all smiles. At the same time, Dole had, just years prior, stripped these same people of their lands with only low-paying, hard-labor jobs as compensation. But it worked. Today, Dole is a multi-billion dollar company, and Hawaii's true history largely goes ignored by Western media and schooling. In 1993, Bill Clinton signed an official apology to the people of Hawaii for overthrowing their government a hundred years prior. But this legislation was just that, an apology. He didn't return any of their land, sign any protection for native Hawaiians, or really do anything besides say, sorry guys. However, the fight isn't over. In recent years, there have been strong pushes for the US government to actually recognize native Hawaiians and restore the country's independent, sovereign government. In 2016, the Department of the Interior put together a plan to make that happen, or at least something like it. Unfortunately, reinstating a government is a hugely complex, controversial issue. Some Hawaiians want to be recognized in the same way that Native Americans are and given those same benefits, a sort of government within a government. But the risk of being blunt, that hasn't really worked out well for Native Americans. So others argue that recognition isn't going far enough. The overthrow violated international law, so the new government of Hawaii was never legitimate in the first place. These people say recognizing Hawaii as a reservation would just be lip service and a continuation of an illegal U.S. occupation. 